We've all heard the saying, change is the only constant, right? Well, that couldn't be more true for our understanding and management of right ventricular, or RV, failure in critically ill patients. Welcome back to our channel, where we explore the latest in medical advances and bring you actionable insights straight from the front lines of healthcare. Today, we're diving into the heart of the matter, quite literally. We're talking about the management of acute right ventricular failure in the intensive care unit, a topic that's witnessed revolutionary developments in recent times. In today's episode, we'll be focusing on fluid management, afterload reduction, and how to enhance contractility using vasoactive medications. And of course, we'll introduce you to the captivating and rapidly expanding field of extracorporeal life support. So buckle up, because we're about to launch into an exploration of the future of acute RV failure management right here in the ICU. You won't want to miss this, so stay tuned. Let's get started by really understanding the pulmonary circulation and the role of the right ventricle, or RV, in our bodies. Contrary to our systemic circulation where increased cardiac output during exercise results in a significant rise in blood pressure, our pulmonary circulation works a little differently. It's a low-pressure circuit at rest and during exercise, where arterial pressure increases minimally even with a surge in cardiac output. This stark difference between the two circulations is based on the lung's ability to recruit partially collapsed or unused vessels as cardiac output increases. The systemic circulation, on the other hand, relies on muscularized arterioles that act as resistors to redistribute blood flow to different organs as needed. What's truly fascinating is the pump behind the pulmonary circulation, the right ventricle or RV, which is significantly different from its counterpart, the left ventricle or LV. With a thin free wall wrapped around the more muscularized medial wall of the LV, the RV is structurally different. At end diastole, it's only about 2 to 3 millimeters thick compared to the 8 to 11 millimeters in the LV. Despite its smaller size, the RV still maintains a greater end diastolic volume and surface area per volume of blood, making it an efficient pump for our bodies. But that's not all. The way these ventricles generate contractile forces also differ. While the LV has a concentric narrowing during systole due to circumferentially oriented myocytes, the RV generates systolic pressures by longitudinal contraction, moving the apex towards the tricuspid valve. This process results in an efficient ejection of RV stroke volume into the proximal pulmonary artery, even during diastole. These structural and functional differences play a significant role in how each ventricle responds to preload and afterload changes. The muscular LV handles abrupt increases in afterload well, but struggles with sudden increases in preload. On the other hand, the more compliant RV can accommodate large increases in right-sided venous return but reacts poorly to acute increases in afterload. Interestingly, because these ventricles share a common septum, abnormalities in the function of one ventricle can adversely affect the function of the other, a phenomenon known as interventricular dependence. As pulmonary vascular resistance increases, the RV struggles to maintain LV filling pressure, leading to a shift of the interventricular septum towards the LV during diastole. In such cases, the LV filling often becomes refractory to intravascular volume expansion. The cornerstone of management of right ventricular, RV, failure in the critically ill involves maintaining or restoring the balance of RV preload, afterload, and contractility. This often requires a multimodal therapeutic approach, starting with the identification and treatment of underlying or precipitating causes of RV failure. St. Optimize Preload. The RV has a more distensible free wall compared to the left ventricle, which allows it to tolerate increases in venous return and maintain stroke volume. However, excessive RV preload can lead to overdistension of the RV and impair cardiac function through a phenomenon known as the Starling mechanism. Next is reducing afterload. As we've discussed, the RV is incredibly sensitive to changes in afterload. So, how can we help? By reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance or PVR. Now, I hear you asking, but how can we reduce the PVR? Well, a variety of methods can be employed. In patients with reversible causes of increased PVR, like pulmonary embolism or acute respiratory distress syndrome, the primary treatment often serves to reduce afterload on the RV. 
In some cases, specific pulmonary vasodilators, such as inhaled nitric oxide or prostacyclin analogs, can be employed, but care should be taken to monitor for systemic hypotension or worsening ventilation perfusion mismatch. Next is enhancing contractility. Moving on, let's talk about enhancing contractility. In cases where the RV is failing due to a decrease in contractility, as might be seen in RV infarction or septic cardiomyopathy, the use of inotropes can be beneficial. Dobutamine is frequently the inotrope of choice due to its positive enotropic effects and mild vasodilatory properties. It's important to note, however, that excessive heart rates can shorten diastolic filling time and increase myocardial oxygen demand, potentially worsening RV function. Next is rhythm and rate control. Keeping the heart in a normal rhythm and at a reasonable rate is crucial for optimal RV function. Atrial fibrillation, a common arrhythmia, can be particularly detrimental for the RV as it leads to loss of atrial contribution to RV filling and often results in rapid ventricular rates. Rate control is usually the first step, followed by consideration for rhythm control. Finally, treating the underlying cause. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, treating the underlying cause of the RV failure as a key aspect of management. This might include aggressive treatment of sepsis in the case of septic cardiomyopathy, revascularization in the case of RV infarction, or anticoagulation in the case of pulmonary embolism. As we move into the approach to managing acute RV failure in critically ill patients, keep in mind that the causes can be broadly categorized into three areas. 1. Excessive preload. 2. Excessive afterload. And 3. Insufficient myocardial contractility. Often, RV failure in the ICU is due to a combination of these factors. Take, for example, a patient with core pulmonale from emphysema who develops severe pneumonia. The conditions causing chronic RV failure can't be reversed in this scenario. Instead, our management should aim at optimizing RV function while reducing the cause of RV failure. Or consider a patient who experiences a sudden increase in RV afterload due to a massive pulmonary embolism. In this case, the first priority should be relieving the increase in afterload. The role of fluid management is pivotal for the successful management of RV failure. The early stages of critical illnesses often see a rapid drop in intravascular volume due to factors like bleeding, increased vascular permeability, and insensible losses. Sedatives and analgesics can decrease systemic venous circulation vasoconstriction, leading to reduced right-sided return. Likewise, positive pressure ventilation may impede RV preload by increasing intrathoracic pressure and reducing RV transmural filling pressure. When suspecting low intravascular volume, we should initiate volume resuscitation as soon as possible. However, RV preload requirements can vary based on whether afterload is normal or increased. For instance, when RV failure occurs in the setting of normal pulmonary vascular resistance, like in right-sided myocardial infarction, we often need to increase RV end diastolic pressure above normal levels to maintain cardiac output. Conversely, when RV failure arises in the context of increased RV afterload, volume loading can cause displacement of the interventricular septum toward the LV, leading to impaired LV diastolic filling. In this setting, we may need to decrease intravascular volume. The RV has a flatter starling curve than the LV, which means a significant amount of volume unloading might be necessary before any improvement in RV function is seen. Simultaneously, we must ensure RV preload does not become too low. To help with assessment of right-sided filling pressures and oxygen delivery, we can use a central venous line that provides access to superior vena cava oxygen saturation and central venous pressure. Normal SVO2 is 70-80%, and lower values can be suggestive of reduced cardiac output. If RV preload is too high, diuresis or dialysis may reduce central venous pressure and improve cardiac output, as assessed by SVO2 or systemic organ perfusion. Echocardiography can also be useful to evaluate RV dilation and its impact on LV filling. For more detailed assessment, a pulmonary artery catheter may be required. Although its routine use doesn't necessarily improve outcomes in severe sepsis management, serial measurements of hemodynamics may guide clinical decision-making in acute RV failure.
Acute RV failure, a fine-tuned balance of afterload should be achieved in order to optimize RV function. This process begins with correcting factors such as hypercapnia, acidemia, and alveolar hypoxia while ensuring adequate ventilation and blood oxygenation. This balance may need to be reassessed when considering the application of various ventilation strategies such as low-volume ventilation, which although beneficial in certain conditions, may lead to unintended complications in the context of acute RV failure. Pulmonary vasodilators present a promising approach to managing acute RV failure. However, careful selection is crucial due to their systemic vasorelaxant properties that can cause hypotension and worsen gas exchange. Inhaled nitric oxide and prostacyclin derivatives are among the most frequently considered due to their potency, rapid onset of action, and minimal systemic side effects. They can significantly improve RV function by reducing afterload. PDE5 inhibitors also have the potential to enhance RV contractility, especially in patients with chronic pulmonary hypertension. Nonetheless, these should be administered cautiously due to their potential systemic vasodilator effects and relatively long half-life. Endothelin receptor antagonists, rheosiguat, and calcium channel blockers are not recommended due to their potential negative effects on the failing RV. The administration of any therapeutic agent must be guided by a detailed understanding of the patient's hemodynamic status and underlying pathophysiology, combined with an assessment of the potential benefits and risks of each therapeutic strategy. Supporting the failing right ventricle with enotropic therapy is the final step in the management of acute right ventricular failure. Unfortunately, most of the available inotropes increase RV afterload through an increase in systemic blood pressure. Nonetheless, these agents may be necessary to support cardiac output in severe cases. Dobutamine, a beta-1 adrenergic receptor agonist, is the most commonly used inotrope in acute RV failure. It improves RV contractility and, to some degree, decreases pulmonary vascular resistance. However, it also increases heart rate and myocardial oxygen consumption, which may worsen myocardial ischemia. Milrinone, a PHOSPHODIESTERASE3 inhibitor, enhances myocardial contractility by increasing intracellular CAMP, and may also reduce RV afterload through pulmonary vasodilation. It does not increase heart rate and may be more effective than dobutamine at reducing pulmonary vascular resistance, but it has a long half-life and is associated with hypotension and arrhythmias. Levosimindan, a calcium sensitizer, has also shown promise in managing acute RV failure. It improves myocardial contractility without increasing intracellular calcium and decreases RV afterload through pulmonary vasodilation. Unlike dobutamine and milrinone, levosimindan does not increase myocardial oxygen consumption. However, it is not available in all countries and its effects can last up to a week which may complicate management of evolving RV failure. Use of these agents should be carefully monitored, with continuous hemodynamic monitoring in the ICU setting. When hypotension occurs, the use of vasopressors may be required to maintain adequate perfusion pressure and avoid exacerbating RV ischemia. Vasopressin can be used as an vasopressor in acute RV failure. Low-dose vasopressin, that is 0.01 to 0.03 unit per minute, can support systemic blood pressure without increasing heart rate or myocardial oxygen demand, and may also reduce pulmonary vascular resistance. However, it should be used with caution in patients with coronary artery disease, because it can induce coronary vasospasm. In some cases, acute RV failure may be refractory to medical management, requiring mechanical support. Intraaortic balloon pump, IABP, can improve coronary perfusion and reduce RV afterload, but may not be effective in patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. Percutaneous ventricular assist devices can provide temporary support for the failing right ventricle, and can be life-saving in patients with refractory RV failure. These devices are thought to be more efficient and have fewer complications than extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. However, they are also more invasive and complex to use, requiring surgical implantation and careful patient monitoring to prevent complications. Percutaneous ventricular assist devices are another option for mechanical support.
The Impella RP, a percutaneous, axial flow, right ventricular assist device, has been used successfully as a bridge to recovery in patients with acute RV failure secondary to myocardial infarction. The tandem heart is another percutaneous, centrifugal flow, right ventricular assist device that has been used for RV support. These devices unload the RV, increase cardiac output, and improve coronary perfusion, but they also require anticoagulation and carry a risk of vascular complications, hemolysis, and infection. Surgical placement of a right ventricular assist device is an option in patients with acute RV failure refractory to medical therapy and who are candidates for heart transplantation or durable ventricular assist device support. These devices can unload the RV and provide circulatory support for weeks to months, but they require a surgical procedure and carry a risk of infection, bleeding, and thromboembolic complications. If you find our videos helpful do like share and subscribe to our channel. Despite these treatment modalities, management of acute RV failure continues to be a challenge, emphasizing the need for a multidisciplinary approach. It is our hope that this review has provided a comprehensive guide for clinicians, offering a clear understanding of the pathophysiology of acute RV failure and a solid foundation for its management. In conclusion, the future of acute RV failure management lies in the balance between immediate aggressive care and long-term strategizing, all aimed towards enhancing patient outcomes and overall quality of life. Thank you.